couple ones I've got to hold on to because they're worth like twenty dollars a piece. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot get them except from like Thailand with a phytosanitary certificate. So what's the market for them? You buy them? Uh, you can sell them on eBay. However, it's a risky business because some of them are classified as invasive, and it varies from state to state. There's so many overlapping laws when it comes to plants that are pretty much. Doing the plant nursery was fun for a while, but it was terrifying because I would, you know, you get emails regularly of people trying to buy stuff you know is illegal and you know it's a sting email. Oh. They're like, can you sell me this plant? No, I can't sell you that plant. But sometimes I'd have to look it up. What is this? Is this plant on any lists? Oh, sure enough, it's on such and such invasive noxious weed list. And I go look it up and go, no, I absolutely can't sell this plant. And then they would never write back. And I had this happen multiple times. I'm like, hey, you know what? Don't they have somebody bad to go after? I just want to sell plants, you know? Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. There's been multiple nurseries in the state that have been popped for various violations, often not even things they knew they were doing. One guy um, had a SWAT team raid his house because he sold the wrong species of orchids. He had all the paperwork that he thought he was supposed to have and a government sting set him up, asked him if he would sell such and such orchid, and he said, sure. And then they raided his house, and they took his stuff, and they shut his business down. I'm like, oh I, it's just not even worth it. I, I got, I found out, like, shipping to Hawaii, you have to have a special certificate. So somebody bought cassava from me and said, would you send me cuttings to Hawaii? And I said, yeah, no problem. I'm about to ship it, and I'm like, I wonder if there's any rules on Hawaii. Oh, yeah, there's all kinds of rules. I had no idea, right? So it's like, yeah, and then I go to different nursery sites, and it'll be like, this plant not approved for Alabama, Mississippi, California, and such and such. I'm like, why is that? I don't even know. I don't even know how to find out. But I know that you're always in danger of getting nailed for something you don't even, it's just, there's just too many rules. And then you have to have, you know, you have to deal with the IRS, you have to deal with the state of Florida, you have to deal with the USDA, you have to deal with the local Marion County and Marion County inspector. It's just like, now Too many dealers. Now forget it. And the sales tax. I got to collect sales tax, even though I was selling only food plants, so they were supposed to be exempt. They still want to see it. I'm like, yeah, forget, it. forget it. It was fun for a little while, but yeah, I learned a lot. You get a lot of partners when you try to start a business, and they're all. <laughs> um, this is a mulberry with, with great big long fruit. If you've ever seen the long fruited mulberry, the fruit is like this long, like a finger, looks like a gigantic berry. They're from Pakistan originally. Um, very cool. Uh, that that one I ordered from a rare plant nursery further north, and we're testing it. This is a mango. They started themselves because I fed mangoes to the chickens. We had really spoiled chickens. Uh, this is uh, another. This see, this looks just like that other tree over there, almost same family, same pattern. But this is Enterolobium contorsequium. This is uh, a very good nitrogen fixer. There's a picture of me, if you look up enterolobium, if you can figure out how to spell it. Um, <laughs> enterolobium, it, on my website, there's a picture of me down in uh, Fruitland Park, standing in front of one of these trees, and the tree is like 100 feet tall and spreading 100 foot. It is a massive tropical rainforest tree. Wow. It's not really all that cold hardy <laughs> here, so it tends to freeze back and come back and get taller over time. But um, it's a great nitrogen fixer, and you just cut it, so it, you don't want a 100-foot tree, um, especially not a nitrogen fixer, it's not going to produce you any food, but it's an excellent nitrogen fixer. You can pull that tree up, and there'd be knots all over the roots full of bacteria and nitrogen, so. Mimosa tree, see it's the same pattern. Look for those leaves, this is um, bipinnate, I believe this is called, uh, and this is, this is a uh, Chinese chestnut that's going to sleep right now. And this tree is here to feed this tree. So in the spring, when this bursts into growth again, I'll cut it back and feed it to the base. For now, it's fine. Uh, these are cool. These attract a lot of butterflies and other insects. If you all want, take some of these that are dry. If you see what they look like, the seeds inside are pitch black. They look like little gemstones. They look like they're made out of uh, jet. This is a cousin of spinach and amaranth. It's called Celosia. They plant sterile versions of it uh, in landscape. You'll see those little powder puff plants and whatever. The leaves are edible, raw or cooked. The seeds are edible. I think it's too much effort to get the grain out of them. I mean, if I was going to do this all day, I'd probably starve to death. <laughs> or I made a biscuit. Yeah. Maybe that's what I do, actually. 
But see how pretty those things are? And they look like it could be glass beads. Yeah, that's beautiful. Very shiny. And um, these self-seed, wherever you plant them, they'll come back again. Very nice little plant. They're easy to pull out. If you're like, oh, I hate these things, you can just yank them out. So everybody, take these things. They're full of seeds. You can see all the black seeds in there still, even though I've been doing this for a while. Take some of these things home with you and plant them. Really good for butterflies. And you can eat them, so. I, I think that they taste a little fuzzy when you eat them raw, but cooked is a great, great little green. It's a pretty plant. Uh, anybody know what this tree is? A, an excellent wood finish comes from this tree. So there's your, there's your tongue clue. Oil. Tongue, yes. This is a tongue oil tree. And uh, people will be like, why are you planting a tongue oil tree? Well, I have no reason except that I like it. I think it looks cool. <laughs> uh, actually, my grandfather was a carpenter, so when I was a teenager, he introduced me to different, some of the different finishes. I used to build guitars kind of as a hobby. And I would go over to his garage, his workshop. He was a boat builder, and he built all these, you know, he would work on yachts and do cabinets and that kind of stuff. And he was always varnishing something or tongue oiling something. As a matter of fact, um, when my grandmother died and she was cremated, he put her ashes into a little box and he varnished the box. And I was like, see, I, I mean, he varnished everything. Finally, my grandma stopped moving long enough for him to varnish her too. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was incredible. But um, <laughs> tongue oil, he introduced me to, he said, this, this oil is pretty much an indestructible oil that bacteria and fungi do not like at all. The fruit are poisonous. It? You have to press the fruit out. They've got a, there's a nut inside of the fruit, and you just crush it in a press, and the oil leaks out. It's kind of like pressing olives, except if you drink the olive oil, it's good for you, whereas this will kill you. Um, <laughs> but that, you know, it's very useful because um, if somebody came into my yard and I didn't want them here, they, they can't eat everything here. They have to know. Some of these things will make you sick, you know, and it's, and it's a mix. Um, but it, but it's also very useful, if, you know. If we had to varnish something um, in a post-apocalyptic scenario. We can get a tongue oil tree. There's, there's really no good reason to plant it other than I thought it was cool. But uh, it's a beautiful tree and um, big, beautiful flowers in the spring. And it'll, it'll get pretty big. It was early 1900s, I think. Someone tried to start a tongue oil venture. Yes, it was. They they were they were um, arguing that tongue oil was going to be the next big thing. There's still random tongue oil trees scattered around Alachua County and elsewhere that have escaped from cultivation. Huh. They have considered putting them on the invasive list, but it's ridiculous because you only see one like every mile or something. It's it's like just let the poor things be. I mean, um, they're they're really a they're a cool looking tree and. I think it was a combination of freezes and hurricanes that ended up knocking out the tongue oil industry. Plus, they found it was much cheaper to just have slave labor in China do it all. You know, so. I, I would love to have the tongue oil nuts and press out some tongue oil just to have done it. You know, you start to realize when, when you want to make your own tires or something like that, how much work it actually takes to get from the plant to doing it. You know, we've made um, cane syrup and had to, you know, chop our own, grow the cane, chop the cane, and do all do all that work. You're like, that's a lot of a lot of work to sweeten the coffee that we, you know, we didn't get to see <laughs> otherwise. Um, here we've got more. There's a lady at the uh, 326 market. I don't know if any of you guys know the 326 market. I know some of you have been there. 326 market is on 326 every Thursday all afternoon. There's a lady over there that sells butterfly plants and pollinator plants. Uh, named Connie, and she's got the most beautiful assortment of flowering plants. So what I would always do is, is go and ask her, okay, which thing brings in the most insects? I want that. Is that porter weed? Uh, I'm not sure. It looks like a porter, porter weed. Yeah. I'm not sure. I actually am really good on edible plants and, and just really don't care about the ornamentals. I would just say, get me something that brings in lots of bugs and then I'll plant it. If it's edible and it brings up bugs, I probably know the name for it. but. Um, yeah, we planted these a couple of years ago, and if it wasn't so grim and cool out, there would be butterflies and bees just, just constantly around this yard. I've watched the butterflies. You see my neighbors keep nice lawns and oaks, and like everywhere it's just lawns and oaks. There's nothing for the wildlife to eat, hardly, except the squirrels that eat the acorns. 
I have watched butterflies circle the yard, go to the edge of the yard, go about 20 feet in and come back. You know, they just do this. They're like, whoa, wait, oh, where are we? You know, um, we just walked out of Golden Corral into an alley. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's like there's just constant activity going on. And the more people have the idea, like, you have to get rid of insects. Don't get rid of insects. You want more insects. Just like in your stomach, right? If you take antibiotics and then you've got to go get yourself some yogurt because nothing is working correctly anymore. It's very important to have a wide range of microorganisms in your gut, and the ecosystem is the same way. The more variety of insects you have, the more balance you have, and the less chances there are that one thing gets out of control, goes crazy, and wrecks everything else. If you've got a massive amount of aphids or stink bugs or something else, something's out of whack. The more weeds and plants and blooms and everything you pack in, you know, you plant a tree, and like I've done, you just plant a ton of stuff around it. We have very little pest problems, even in our gardens out back, which we'll get to eventually. What do you um, say about praying mantises? I don't see very many of them. I love praying mantises. You can order the egg sacs in the early spring and put them up. I've always felt like, I mean, you could you could do it, but I've, I've kind of felt like if they're not here already, you know, they'll find me eventually. Mm -hmm. But it would be a good head start. Know. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I, I've known people that have bought ladybugs and mantises and things like that. And a lot of the people that buy it, their yard is real clear of stuff. Mm -hmm. And they bring it in, and they're all going to run away, you know, or die, you know, because there's nothing for them to be there. The lizards are going to eat them because they have no place to hide. Um, if you've got an ecosystem like this, anything that comes into it, you know, tends to, tends to stay. Um, but, it, but it doesn't get out, and nothing gets out of control, so... So when you ask the insect lady to, or the, the butterfly plant lady or whatever, to whatever brings a lot of insects, you don't ask her what type of insect or anything? You just say, hey, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's like just, I want stuff that brings in bugs. That's it. And, and uh, most of her stuff is all um, for, she actually has a lot of hummingbird plants, and I like hummingbirds, so I plant stuff for them too. But they have overlap with the butterflies and the bees. So if it brings in butterflies and bees, that's great. One of the great plants for bringing in a lot of good insects is um, that milkweed, the weedy milkweed that grows all over the place. You'll get assassin bugs that live on it, and edible? ladybugs come and get it. I don't think so. Something smells like basil. Yeah, but there is a basil really right here. Somewhere. Oh, this yeah. is one of the best. I just posted a video of this basil, actually. If you look up David the Good on YouTube, I've got like almost 2,000 subscribers now. Um, I just posted this basil this has a little more um it's almost like it's like this it's like the stuff that's in vix it's got a little of that mixed into it but it's a very good culinary basil it has a very unique flavor to it and it's perennial it's sterile basil it's actually a cross between two different varieties that happen naturally and the only way to propagate it is through cuttings it doesn't ever set seeds so it doesn't die. Usually a basil sets seeds and it goes, I've reproduced, I'm done, and, it, and it's gone. So this one has been working on its master's degree for like 30 years. So um, it just keeps going and going and going, and, and it can't reproduce. So um, people have propagated. It's called African blue basil. Very good. The bees love it. And um, I, I, I'm a big fan of planting it around or near fruit trees. You know. This one I just kind of stuck... I stuck islands of plants in here. This is a this is the worst portion of the yard soil-wise. Still better than most of Florida. If you look at the soil here, that gray is good. You want gray, you don't want yellow, and you don't want white. That's not good. And that that hard combination of clay and sand is brutal too. That like pale reddish. No. Um, this is this is almost sandy loam. Yeah. But this is the worst part of my yard. The other side's better. We'll, we can walk over there. So this area is kind of just, I have thrown seeds out here and run chickens and done all kinds of things, and it's not really improved all that much in the five years I've been here. Mostly because, you know, when you're dealing with this much space, you can't concentrate your effort. If I took a big load of mulch and spread it out here, it would make no difference whatsoever. I need like 20 loads of mulch to even start this area. So I concentrated on up here and over here where the soil was already doing pretty good. As interestingly, um, to give you an idea, this loquat tree here was planted five years ago at the same time as that loquat tree right there. Mm. Oh, wow. 
And you see the difference. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Huge difference. Yeah, big difference. This is bad over here. I mean, yeah. this is the, the Sixth Street Mulberry from the Edible Plant Project, this little mulberry tree here. That tree's been there for two years. Mulberries usually grow like six feet a year. That's kind of pathetic. I'll wait for everybody to catch up. I like the variegated leaves. That's um, probably magnesium deficiency that gives it the really? variegation. Yeah, I could give it a little more magnesium and it'll clean up. It's actually the, I think the lime off of the road here uh -huh. um, makes it a little difficult for it to take up as many nutrients. If the pH varies, plants are unable to take up nutrients as well. Oh, there's okay. Cuban oregano under there, and probably a couple other things. Okay, this uh, this is the good side of the yard, um, and this is actually a, a grapefruit tree. I planted a grapefruit tree, uh, or what was labeled as a grapefruit tree. So this is this is the only grapefruit tree I've ever seen that bears tangerines. So I, I think. I'm really proud of it, you know, you just don't see that. Uh, so it ended up a tangerine tree. We found out for the first time last year, it was like, oh, tangerines? I mean, it was, it was a little yellow fruit. I'm like, that is a really tiny grapefruit. And then it started to turn orange. And I was like, wow, a grapefruit tree that bears tangerines. So anyhow, yeah, um, nursery men don't always... Uh, they're not infallible. Uh, I got it. I got it, and it's like I love tangerines. I wouldn't care. I wouldn't care if it made a fruit that I can't stand because all fruit is valuable. I could always trade it or give it to somebody else. It doesn't matter. Um, this plant over here, if anybody's familiar with it, this is a marvelous plant. This is a relative of black pepper, but here, just pass it around and smell it. It's, it's incredible. You smell it. This is, um, smell familiar? <laughs> this is called uh, Piper Aratum, or the root beer plant. And it makes the most, if you take, uh, my wife made kombucha tea, and she poured the kombucha over it for a week and just let it soak in there. And it was like root beer. Oh it was God. incredible. It's the same flavor that's in sassafras. It's the same compound. It's not related to sassafras at all. Not called? even vaguely. It's called root beer plant. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And uh, <laughs> some people don't like it because it spreads. I planted one little one in there and it grows. If it's in a shadier area, it's happy and it'll just kind of fill it in. Who cares? I mean, it tastes, it tastes good. You can eat it raw. Um, you can make burritos out of it if you want to, if you want root beer flavored burritos. <laughs> you can why, eat not? why not? <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's root beer plant. That's that's a cool plant. How do you propagate root beer plant? You, uh, you've got to divide off the pieces of it. Like, you see how it makes a different shoot? You can take it, or you can take the cutting, and sometimes it will root from the cutting. I've, I've done pretty well. I planted one plant, and you can see it's moved about six foot over the years. Um, two years or so since I put it in. That's uh, Yakon, the root crop on the top. Okay, this uh, fig right here, um, I started this from a cutting. And I, I have a theory on figs. A lot of people have planted figs and you buy a fig tree that's like six foot tall from Home Depot and you stick it in the ground and it sits there for like two or three years and it does nothing. And you go, what happened? I found when, when you start a cutting off of a fig tree, which is really easy, you just take a piece and stick it in the ground basically. Um, if you start a cutting off of a fig tree and then put it in the ground when it's still little before the roots have developed, it seems like it has a lot of vigor when it's young. But if it sits in a pot and the roots circle around a few times, it loses its vigor. I planted multiple trees when I moved in that were six foot tall. They're, they've died back and they're like three foot tall, four foot tall. They, they don't look good at all. But these, this was a one foot tall cutting that I planted three years ago. And that other fig that's right next to the loquat that just looks like a stick right now, it was the same thing. 
and they'll bear fruit at like two years from a cutting. It's incredible. This um, right here, this is a yellow green fig. This one branch is a purple fig from a variety <laughs> called Texas Everbearing that I grafted in this spring just for fun. It's got a couple of branches on here. It's gonna, if, if it makes it before the freeze, we're gonna have purple figs on the end of this. And it's funny because I grafted it this spring and it's already bearing fruit. Figs are real good at that. Um, very precocious tree. I also, we were talking about biochar a little bit earlier. Uh, I had a burn pile right here. I dropped all the charcoal down and I also threw a bunch of leaves and stuff when we had a couple of our oaks removed. Piled it up right here. And there's a dead tree right there. So there's a lot in the ground there that it liked. This was um, really, it's still good looking soil after a while of being here. It's, it looks a lot better than the sand. If you got any of you are dealing with like scrubland soil, I'm sorry. Um, I'll, try not to, I'll try not to show off my soil too much because really half of the gardening is the soil, uh, not the gardener. But it's, David. There's, nothing, there's nothing to do about it. I don't worry about it. Okay. Some varieties get it more than others. Um, and this time of year, they always look terrible. In the spring, it'll look green and lush and perfect. And then we'll get a bunch of rain and it may decide to drop all its leaves or start again. I've, I've had them drop their leaves a couple of times in a year sometimes. I don't know why you did that, you know, but it did. It did it anyways. Uh, this branch fell off of this oak tree here, which is a terrifying oak tree. As you can see, the bottom's rotted out. And it crosses parallel. Right. It's, um, we have very limited excitement out here, so <laughs> this is this is like a suspense film. <laughs> right, one of these days, man, it's going. But uh, in here, I've planted gingers because we've got some shade. Here's different varieties of ginger. This is uh, this is one of our grasses. I'm not sure which one this is. There's also pawpaws in here um, that are scattered here and there. That's actually a stick right behind you. That is a pawpaw. That's a little native one. You wouldn't have to worry. If you stepped on it, it would come back. They actually grow in horse pastures. They get mowed to the ground, and then they come back again, and they still make pawpaw. Yeah. These are turmeric, turmeric ginger, which is really expensive by root. It's very strongly anti-cancer. That's where you get the yellow in curry. And turmeric grows really easy here. If you get a chance, if you go to like Whole Foods or the Asian market where they have turmeric roots, this time of year, take them and bury them in the ground wherever you want turmeric. And then next year you'll forget all about it and you'll think it's dead. And then in about June, it starts coming up. The first time I grew turmeric, it's dying in November. And, uh, and I'm thinking, they're gone. I mean, it gets, to sp it gets to spring and it's March and it's April. The ground's warm. Everything's come out of the ground. Now nah, they're dead. They gotta be dead. They don't come up till June, mid-June. So they only are awake half the year. It takes about two years to get big enough to harvest, but then you can pull turmeric out. I helped a lady pull out a five gallon bucket of turmeric roots. I went, this is like $200 of turmeric. That was incredible. You know, and it's so easy to grow. The bugs don't bother it or anything. You got a half shady spot, go and spend the money to buy a few pounds of turmeric and go plant it in there. And it's perennial it comes back year after year. And it'll, you know, you harvest some out, throw a couple of pieces back in the hole and do it again. Keep it mulched. Don't water it in the winter. It grows very very easy and it's very high value a lot of our problem with gardening is that we're trying to grow stuff that's not really suited to the area so you know something high value that's really well suited to the area like turmeric makes a lot of sense you know go sell it and buy something you can't grow here you know or trade it um, we can come through this way there's all gingers there and then there's the big uh, loquat there some of you all probably know this tree Take a, if you take this leaf and rip them and smell them and pass them on, you can shred them into pieces. Tell me what it smells like. It's more. So which one? Do the ginger? Hey, she called it. Uh, Florida has about three varieties of or more varieties of native bay, multiple of which are native. Oh, it's bay leaf? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. These are in the woods around here. So, <laughs> you go up and you see a tree that has these nice, shiny, pretty looking leaves. Break the leaf, 
crush it up. Bay, you can tell by the smell. Very aromatic. And cook soups. As in the soups. Uh, apparently, they also repel some insects, too. How do you get them started? Uh, sometimes, they, often they just start themselves. If you search the woods, if there's any native woods, chances are there's a bay in it. There's, there's hundreds of them around my neighborhood here. The problem is, is a lot of the bays are getting hit by a um, disease that came in. It's called laurel wilt, and it affects avocados as well. So a lot of the bay trees, if you've seen trees by the side of the road with all the leaves are brown and it's dead, and you go, what happened to that tree? Did it get hit by lightning? No, it was probably a bay that got laurel wilt. It's all over. About four years ago when the laurel wilt came into this neighborhood, about a quarter of the forest was just dead bay trees. It was ridiculous. However, the little seedlings come up all over the place, and they live for quite a while, and then they get to a certain size, and they get killed, and then another one comes up. They're not getting wiped out. They're just, we just lost a lot of the big ones. This is a uh, kumquat here, this little teeny tree. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't make like a highway size um, <laughs> set of pathways through here. Is this the biggest tour you've had, Dave? Uh, Ish? Close. Close. I think the biggest one I had was a prepper group that mm. came through. That was kind of cool. Um, this is um, Moringa. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a nitrogen fixing. You can see the little, uh, these little beans that are right here. What is that? That is called um, butterfly pea. You can use the blooms for a blue-violet dye, and uh, yeah, it's kind of uh, it's kind of a cool plant. And it in itself seeds. You can take some of the seed pods if you want them. They're not edible, unfortunately, but they have really pretty blooms, and um, they do fix nitrogen. So yeah, it's kind of cool. <laughs> the kumquat is one of the few citrus you can actually eat the uh, the peels and the the entire fruit. These are not quite ready. They'll be ready in about another month or so. They start getting good. And there's there's lots of bits and pieces through here. Like here's a fig. This tree back here, this big scrubby looking silvery thing is called an autumn olive. That is a nitrogen fixing tree they used to use for mine reclamation. There's a uh, orange tree right back there. You can kind of start to when you're building a food forest, you look for the tallest stuff first, and then you plant the, the mid canopy, and then you plant the short stuff, and you plant the ground cover. So I planted the tallest stuff first, and in the early parts, I can grow like cassava. You know, I can grow cassava roots, and I can grow, um, you know, sweet potatoes and all kinds of other stuff. And we've come out here, we've grown kale out here, and cabbages, and all kinds of stuff kind of just scattered around. You can garden in between everything. When the canopy starts to connect, basically you're dealing with tree crops much more than you are the short stuff. So this is a kind of an intermediary ecosystem at this point. We're halfway between sunlight and canopy, and it's actually a pretty good place to keep it. You know, if you plant things a little further apart, you can always kind of garden in between the trees. But I don't know how to do anything halfway, so this will all be canopy eventually. Um, pear tree here. If you want to grow pears in Florida, it is possible, um, but you've got to plant what are called sand pears. Sand pears because they grow in the sand. Um, this is there's a couple of varieties of them: um, Hood and Baldwin and pineapple is one of my favorites. Orient is another one, but it doesn't taste as good. Um, this tree has been about four years in, I'd say, so it's getting about to the point where it would bear probably next year. Um, but the, the pears in general, like the Florida Northern the sweet pears and stuff, they don't grow all that well. But the sand pears are the real hard pears. And they are awesome for pear pies, pear jam, pear butter, pear sauce. And uh, we made pear salsa with them because we had, at our previous house in Tennessee, we had so many pears we didn't know what to do with it. We had probably 100 or 200 pounds of pears off of a couple of trees. And so we made pear salsa, I made pear wine. Some of the pear wine fell into the pressure cooker and it somehow like turned into pear vodka. But, and, um, you know, the, the, the pears you can do so much with. And people are like, I don't like those pears, they're hard. Like, 
It's food. I mean, put it in the dehydrator. You can make like leather pear, you know, the little chewy pears out of your head, dried apple slices. It's great. And the pear salsa we made, instead of putting tomatoes in, we put pears in. So it was this sweet, hot salsa. And it was so good. And I don't even like pears in general. You know, I liked um, pear vodka, but you know, <laughs> pear salsa was, it was, the pear salsa was awesome. We were like, we ended up making about 50 jars of it and giving it away for um, Christmas presents one year. And then people were begging us to make more. But we moved down here, and I haven't had enough pears to make it with. So, yeah, it was awesome. Uh, this is a honey locust tree, which has already gone to sleep. The jury is out on whether it's actually a nitrogen fixer or not. A lot of the permaculture people plant them because they say it fixes nitrogen and improves the soil. I don't know. Some people swear it doesn't. Some people say it does. It has uh, pods that are kind of a little bit like a tamarind pod. If you've ever had tamarind, it's got a sweet part on the inside of the pod that you can chew and it tastes like candy. Some of them are really good, some of them are not. It also has really hard wood that takes a long time to rot. It's just a cool looking tree. Did you have honey locust or did you have black locust? The black locust has got the thorns on all of the leaves. The black locust is a really good nitrogen fixer. And the root, the... You just don't want to grab it. You just don't want to grab it, yeah. And, and the, uh, the wood does not rot. Like 40 or 50 years, you can make a pole out of it and stick it in the ground to build a fence. And that's what they used to do. They would plant cedars or black locusts on the farmsteads in a section when they first moved in, knowing that in 20 or 30 years when they had to replace the fence, it would be there. People don't usually think that long anymore. They don't want to think any further past next week. You know, but a tree like that's valuable. That's a honey locust. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the lemons. The lemons will get you. They'll tear you up. And uh, key lime. I mean, I hate pruning the key lime tree. So the cassava here.